Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that's number two in your programs and in our batting order, but of course, number one in your hearts. He is the captain. Also known as the second best in the garage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. I'm excited about this beer here, Captain. Look at me. I'm I'm chair dancing. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of embarrassing. You know, most of the time we pick a beer because it's from the area of the story that we're covering. Other times we pick a beer because, you know, maybe the name is clever. Maybe there's a clever play on words in there. And then sometimes, as is the case today, we select a beer that, frankly, we just really want to drink it. So today we are excited to be trying We Don't Need No Stinking Coast by the hardworking people at Six Sense Brewing Company in the cozy town of Jackson, Ohio. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. We Don't Need No Stinking Coast is a super hazy double IPA brewed in that East Coast style. And it's got a low hop, high citrus thing going on. And this delicious beer from the Six Sense Brewing Company was brought to us by these hardworking citizens. First up, we have to thank Andrew and Janice from, well, I'm guessing from Jackson County, Ohio, because they are the ones that sent us the Six Sense beer. Chan the bang. So a big thank you to Andrew and Janice. Next, we have to thank all the beautiful ladies at Rachel's Cakes. That's Melissa, Jody, Tina, and of course, Rachel. Thank you, ladies. We like your cakes. Next, we have Tiffany in Guam. She's sending us a thank you because she was binge listening to True Crime Garage during her 20 hours of travel from Guam to Thailand. Mm, well, you could have came and visited us, but I guess you don't like us that much. And a big we like a jib to Kathy in Rockwell, Iowa. And a big, big thank you to two loyal and longtime listeners. We have Rick and Monica in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, and we have a big shout out to Jessica from Hereford. What kind of, what kind of name is that? I was there, Ferd. Now I'm here, Ferd, Arizona. Big, uh, we like your gym. And last but not least, down in Holy Springs, North Carolina, a shout out to Elizabeth. So thank you to everybody for filling up the fridge this week. And if you want to buy us a round for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, all that stuff, you can follow us at True Crime Garage. All right, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of the fifth nail. We couldn't tell you this story without first telling you about a website. The Fifth Nail website, or the fifthnail.blogspot.com. The site is an online web blog that feels and reads much like a personal journal, a personal journal from the blog's creator. The name The Fifth Nail comes from, according to the site's creator, an old myth, a myth about the crucifixion of Christ, and states gypsies crafted five nails for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ but only four were used by the Romans. The fifth nail was intended to pierce the heart of Christ, but the gypsies hid the nail from the Romans. Depending on which story you follow from the blog, the gypsies were either rewarded or punished for having done this. Rewarded for trying to protect Christ and having gone against the Romans, were punished for causing the already very painful death to last longer than necessary. Other stories on the blog would say the fifth nail is a sacred artifact, a relic that holds great power. But once you get past the crafty name, within the journal entries, the writer has made it obvious this is a one-person protest site, one person voicing their opinions against the registration laws of sex offenders. 
stating that punishments for having committed crimes only lead to more crimes. The Fifth Nail blog was created in January of 2004. On this blog, the writers spoke of past crimes they had committed, about their daily life, and about wanting to change the penal system, and also wanting to have a closer relationship with God. In one of the first posts, the writer states, this site can be a voice for repressed criminals. The site nor the blogger condones criminal acts or behavior, but rather this is a reminder that the criminal, too, just like the rest of us, is a human being. In other posts, the author says the blogger is not a pedophile. And if you review the post regarding past crimes committed, it is obvious they believe these were simply crimes committed by a confused young person who was acting out because of abuse they had suffered. This tone rings throughout other posts, suggesting simply that criminals are victims too. Furthermore, it is the belief of the fifth nail that the cure for crime, criminals, and criminal activity is love, much like Christ taught people to love their enemies. The blogger also states, they knew all about abuse from every angle, from the perspective of not only the abuser, but the victim as well and they were recommending lighter and less strict punishments for offenders, saying offenders should be offered counseling and treatment programs rather than jail time. In April of 2005, the readers of The Fifth Nail would notice an obvious change into the tone and mindset of the author. By now, the author was clearly depressed and most likely suicidal. The blog post making reference to what the author calls the demons. Saying things like, The demons are stronger than ever. I am alone and only God can save me. I might be the only one who can understand the nature of the demons. I am very afraid because if the demons win, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Very badly hurt. I continue to pray that God will help me. Please pray for me because I don't know if the right choice is even an option now. On Wednesday, May 11th, there was a post submitted titled, The Demons Have Taken Over. And it stated, It's too late. It's too late for God to take care of the demons, because the demons have locked up the happy person in the same dungeon where the demons had once been locked up. And now, with the happy person locked up, the demons are loose. And now, I am very, very afraid. The demons have caused me to question my faith to God, and I am losing my religion, and that is how they got the key and got out of the dungeon and locked me up. Not only am I afraid, but I am also very, very angry. Angry with society. I'd like to kill myself, but I don't know if I can. I would like to hurt society as much as possible and then die. As for the happy person I once was, well, the happy person was just a dream. And as it turns out, the happy person never really existed at all. Turns out the demons were alive and well long before the dream of the happy person. Two days later, on Friday the 13th, the author made the last blog post. It was a lengthy post, but the gist of it, the author wrote, Is taking people with me right or wrong? And does it really matter? A million years from now, will there even be people? Will any of this matter? I have a disease I have contracted from society. I hope I will be able to finish my online journals before dying, which I hope will be soon. Or maybe, with some help, I could turn myself in. That might still be a possibility. But the problem with that is the demons are in control and not the happy person. Just two days after the final blog post on the fifthnail.com website, 
on May 15, 2005. Our story takes us to a place called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. For those of you not familiar, that's about 30 miles east of Seattle, and the population back then would have been roughly about 40,000 people. Well, our story will take place just outside of there, near Lake Coeur d'Alene. Robert Hollingsworth hired a neighbor boy to mow his grass. He hired 13-year-old Slade Groney. Slade was your typical American young teenage boy. His family did not have much money, so he was helping out doing some work for his neighbor, Mr. Hollingsworth, you know, to earn some walking around money. The arrangement the two had made was that Robert Hollingsworth would get the exact amount of money that they had agreed on and pay the boy the following day. So on May 15th, when the work was done, Slade Groney returned to his home across the street where he lived with his mother and his mother's long-term boyfriend. Now, we said that Slade had finished the work for the day over at the Hollingsworth property and returned home. Mm -hmm. Well, the next day on May 16th in the evening, Robert Hollingsworth goes over to the neighbor's house to pay the boy for his hard work. On his walk over, he can see the family is likely home as the two vehicles that they owned were parked in the driveway in their normal spots. And as he gets closer, he notices that both the vehicles have several of the doors sitting open. He walks past the vehicles, ducking down to look inside, and he continues on walking towards the front door. The car doors are open but both in both cars, but nothing seems to be out of the ordinary. As Hollingsworth approaches the front door, he's going to notice some blood on the wall. Yeah, he's going to see what what appears to be quite a bit of blood. Um, as he takes another step, he can see that there's there's blood on the actual door and on the porch steps as well. So we have it on the walls, the door, and the steps. Well, this frightens Hollingsworth, and and of course he runs back to his house and he goes for the phone. He calls nine one one and he reports that when he went to his neighbor's house, uh, he thinks that he saw a lot of blood on the front porch and the door. You know, so please send the police and an ambulance as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Members of the sheriff's department arrive at the scene. They knock on the doors and they receive no answer. But of course, the blood on the door in the front porch will give the officers probable cause to enter the home. They quickly find a side door to the home unlocked and they enter. According to the officers, the first thing they notice is that there's blood everywhere. They see two bodies lying dead in an area between the kitchen and the living room. Around each body, there is a large pool of blood. Both victims had been bound with duct tape and and zip ties. Both had been hit many times in the head and face. One of the victims appeared to have been shot in the head, possibly at close range. This was the body of 13-year-old Slade. He was face down in a puddle of blood. There was quite a good amount of duct tape wrapped around his head and around his wrist as well. And laying next to Slade will be his mother in her own pool of blood. This is Brenda Groney. Uh, She too is face down in blood, and it appeared that the blood had been coming from her head. Her wrists were bound behind her back and her feet bound with zip ties. Mm -hmm. In the living room, there was another obvious sign of violent death, and this is similar to what the sheriffs had just seen. A man later identified as Mark McKenzie lay in blood, wrist-bound with duct tape and feet with zip ties. And this would be the long-term boyfriend. Correct. He's actually the owner of the home. Officers surmise that he, too, had been killed by either a gunshot or blunt force trauma to the head. Robert Hollingsworth also tells the sheriffs that less than 24 hours before the bodies were discovered that he had called the sheriff's department to report a suspicious truck he found on his property. Mm -hmm. The crime scene was so bloody and horrific that many of the deputies nearly got sick. After a thorough search of the home, deputies noted that they found a lot of blood. Now, this was all over the inside of the home, and this included footprints, handprints, blood smears. There was spatter on the walls and floor as well as droplets on the floor. So the police find three victims. We have two adults and we have one teenage boy. Mm -hmm. But they don't find any other victims on the property or in the home. Now, this is late Monday night. And by the time they go through the crime scene, now we're close to early Tuesday, right? 
And the sheriff's department, they start notifying family members regarding the murders of their loved ones. One family member, uh, one family member of Brenda's is notified that three murder victims were found in the home. And the, the lady, she then tells them, well, you must be mistaken. There should be five victims there, not three. Okay. So the, the, the sheriff's department immediately are like, what's going on? Why would this, this person that we're notifying tell us, tell us that we should be seeing five victims here? Uh, so when pressed again, she says the same thing. You know, th- there should be five victims here, not three. This is not the last the sheriff's department would hear of this. And after confirming this suspicion, the sheriff's department realizes that they have a whole new set of problems on their hands. They not only have three murdered victims, a killer or killers on the loose, right. but now they have two missing children to look for as well. Yeah, we have nine-year-old Dylan and we have eight-year-old Shasta. Yeah, because see, at the time of the crime, you know, that particular night, there were five people in that house. There's Mark McKenzie. He's 37 years old. He's mm-hmm. the long-term boyfriend and the owner of the home, as we had stated. There's Brenda Groney, uh, the mother. Uh, she's she's the mother of, of five kids, but three of her kids live there. So we have 13-year-old Slade, who we had mentioned, who was found dead in the home. But we also have nine-year-old Dylan. Uh, that the captain captain mentioned, as well as the little sister Shasta, captain. who's eight. Old captain. So uh, Brenda had two older kids that did not live at the house, um, and her ex husband, who was very active in his children's lives, had his own place and saw the children on a regular basis. So now the sheriff's department, law enforcement, are wondering where is Dylan and where is Shasta. Now, of course, there was a thorough search conducted at both the Groney property and then at the Hollingsworth property as well. And at the discovery of the murders, they conducted these searches. But again, as once the suspicion was confirmed that we have missing children, well, they're going to search again. So we've just combined those two searches and listed what the sheriff's department noted as of importance uh, together. We already talked about all the blood at the Groney McKenzie house. Mm -hmm. And we talked about Mark and Brenda being bound with duct tape and zip ties, uh, tape on the wrist and zip ties binding the feet. Slade was only bound with duct tape around his wrist and some on his head as well, but no zip ties on his ankles. There was a second structure on the property on the McKenzie Groney property. This is, is like a large shed. Um, and I should point out before we get too far into this, that these, these properties that we're discussing, they're very, they're large properties. You know, we're talking about, uh, large front yards, large backyards. So, so a, a big, it, maybe a acre and a half, two acres. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're okay. of substantial size. So in this structure, uh, they find, they find of additional vehicles. Now, these were family vehicles. In okay, the so this is more like a pool barn or something. Correct, correct. And not a little shed, a big a big uh, pool barn, like mm-hmm. you said. They find some extra vehicles on the Groney property as well, one including a camper. I believe all of these vehicles end up belonging to the Groney or McKenzie family. Now, on Mr. Hollingsworth property, they found a 1988 silver Ford pickup truck with Idaho plates. Now, this is registered to Lisa and Daniel Miller. This is the vehicle, this is the quote-unquote abandoned truck that Mr. Hollingsworth had reported as suspicious earlier to the Sheriff's Department. Okay. Now, he says that he first saw it on the the McKenzie Groney property around 8 p.m. on Sunday, May 15th. He says that he then saw it again the next day. This would be very early, about 6.30 in the morning, but this time the the truck was on his property. Hmm. So before these events had, before these events, he had never seen this truck before. Uh, the truck is still on his property at the time of the search in the bed of the truck, the sheriff's department, they find a roll of duct tape and they also find a a ball of wadded up duct tape as well. This is duct tape, obviously, obviously matching tape that was used at the murder scene. Yeah. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah. So the truck is their first major lead law enforcement stated, quote, Nothing appeared to be stolen from the crime scene except for the kids. There was an Amber Alert that was issued for the disappearance of nine-year-old Dylan Groney and his little sister, eight-year-old Shasta Groney. 
Search parties were sent out to search the wooded areas surrounding the family's homes and then extending out from there. They conducted searches with both tracking and cadaver dogs, both on foot and on horseback. Because one would hope that maybe why these attacks happen on on three individuals that maybe they somehow got away and uh, or possibly that they were killed and their bodies were moved somewhere. As I like to say, you're exactly right, Captain, that the the first of what you said was exactly their suspicion. They they were hopeful and thought, Hope, ma- yeah, yeah, maybe hopeful. these kids got away and they're hiding in the woods somewhere and they're just afraid to come out because they're they're terrified of what they had seen or heard. Yeah. So what the sheriff's department is going to do is they're going to divide into two teams. One is going to take on the triple homicide and the other team is going to be searching for the two missing children. Yes, and on Tuesday, May 17th, the Sheriff's Department, they announced that after interviewing friends and family of the victims, uh, that they have a person of interest. A person of interest has emerged from this group. All right. And this is Robert Roy Lutner. Uh, He's age 33. He's a large guy. He's about 6 foot 3, 230, 240 pounds. Right. Uh, He's nicknamed Concrete Bob. Uh, He's also a friend of the family. Okay. He is someone that visited the home a couple of times just days before the murders. And it's believed that he even visited the home on Sunday evening, maybe just hours before the slayings were committed. So a friend of the longtime boyfriend. Um, yeah, I, I got the vibe that it was a friend of both of them. Okay. Um, and it, But this is Concrete Bob, right? Right. So Concrete Bob is the number one suspect at this time. And how he emerges as a suspect is, is like this. Okay. So remember we said that Brenda Groney had two older children that did not live at the home. Yeah. Well, one of these children, this is Jesse Groney. Um, he tells the sheriff's department that Concrete Bob owed his mother and his mother's boyfriend about $2,000. Okay. Jesse also explained that even though Concrete Bob owed the family money, there did not seem to be any bad blood regarding this loan or any bad blood between the family and Concrete Bob. Yeah, but <laughs> there's that psychological thing that if you if you lend somebody money, they instantly start resenting you, mm-hmm. even though you lent them money. Well, the thing here is, you know, he he states that even though the family didn't have much money at all, mm-hmm. he didn't see he didn't see his mother and her boyfriend pressuring Concrete Bob to repay this money at any time soon. Right, but when the sheriff's department is talking to other family members about Concrete Bob, they're they're stating, look, um, he you know maybe has a little bit of a criminal past. But he's he's not somebody that we would suspect of being able to do this. Yes. What was his criminal past? Uh, he had some drug possession charges. Mm-hmm. He also had domestic battery. Uh, this was for fighting with a girlfriend outside of a bar. I guess this domestic battery charge ended up being reduced to just disturbing the peace. Uh, he also had two counts of fraud on his record as well. Now, here's the suspicious thing, though, Captain. Concrete Bob took a trip um, to Boise the day after the bodies were found. Uh, he drove a truck uh, that, that matched the truck found on the Hollingsworth property, but we, we know that that was registered to some other people. So right. there's a little confusion there, but still interest. The Sheriff's Department, they are looking for this Concrete Bob, who, as we said, conveniently took a trip the day after the murders, well, they don't have to look very long or very hard because about a day after they announced that he was a person of interest, mm-hmm. Concrete Bob comes forward and he talks with the sheriff's department. They interview him for 16 hours. Wow. They gave him a polygraph test. And as what was reported was that Concrete Bob passed the polygraph test with flying colors. Mainly gray, though. So after all of this, Concrete Bob was cleared and he's no longer a suspect. The thing here is, though, Captain, we have the autopsies to discuss. Now, remember when the bodies were found, we have the situation where it it was believed that the victims could have either been shot in the head or they were killed by blunt force trauma to the head. Mm -hmm. The autopsies revealed that it was not gunshots, but it was, in fact, blunt force trauma to the head. And did they have the weapon? Um, they, they had their suspicions, but they were not going to announce that to the public. Um, what they found regarding the injuries were brain contusions and skull fractures. 
uh, the sheriff's department, as we said, was not announcing the weapon they believed used in the attack. However, a local paper was saying that a claw hammer was used on the victims. Well, it's actually surprising that the sheriff's department talked to Concrete Bob for as long as they did, and they didn't, you know, give him every piece of the, you know, evidence of what happened and get him to falsely confess. Oh, like we've seen very uh, recently on yeah. this show. Do you know if the sheriff's department has a time of death? Well, what they find out is that this is based off of the body temperatures. It was determined that the three had died either in the late Sunday evening hours or early Monday morning hours. So that doesn't it doesn't tell us much. We both could have guessed that. Well, it, they they weren't found until Monday evening. So it, it only it only really closes the window a little bit, but it, it still leaves us a, a, a decent sized window to work with there. Now, when they when they conduct the toxicology reports, mm-hmm. uh, the two on the on the adults revealed the presence of THC and methamphetamine in both Brenda and Mark. All right, so they're smoking some pot. Yeah, and they're. they're- they're doing a little bit of recreational drugs. It it, it looks like, mm-hmm. um, and there is there is no definitive proof. Wait, so is meth considered recreational? Uh, I I guess all drugs might be considered <laughs> recreational. I've seen that recreational. Uh, um, but regardless, the toxicology report reveals the presence of both THC and methamphetamine. Now, even though there's no definitive proof of this. The sheriff's department was going to go with the theory that because five victims were controlled and right. at least three of them were bound, there there was a strong possibility that they were looking for more than one perpetrator. Yeah. Also, they could not find any sign of forced entry. So this, of course, was suggesting a strong possibility that the victims knew the perpetrators. The, the other strange thing here is that the McKenzie and Groney household, well, it had plenty of firearms in the home. You know, hunting is very is very popular in that area, and that's something that some of the family members participated in. Right. Uh, that not only were there firearms scattered kind of throughout in different parts of the home, uh, several of these were loaded, and they, you know, stashed loaded throughout the home, found by the sheriff's department, but none of them were found near where the victims lay. Um, so it, it didn't appear that any of the victims had tried to go for these weapons in any form of defense. Well, they were high on meth. One thing that the sheriff's department was wondering about was maybe the killers watched the house and may have been able to pull off some kind of surprise attack in the middle of the night. This would also be evidence why these guns were not used for defense. Um, but of course, the sheriff's department is working with the expectation that the two missing children, Dylan and Shasta, are still alive. We'll get right back to the case of the fifth nail right after this quick beer break. Right, we're back. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. So we were going through some of the sheriff's department's thoughts and feelings early on in this investigation. Some things that they had noticed at the crime scene, what that was leading them to believe and theorize regarding the the perpetrators that they were looking for. Now, I do want to point out here that the sheriff's department made sure to tell the media and the community that this home, this home was not a drug house. The sheriff's department found no evidence to suggest that the house was used to manufacture, store, or sell drugs. And actually, I don't believe that they found any actual drugs in the house at all. So everything here is is simply just pointing to the drugs being found in the in the system of the adults of Brenda and Mark. Right. So the sheriff's department at this point is just basically stating that recreational drug use has nothing to do with the actual crimes or the possible abductions of the two um, children. Yeah, that's that's what the evidence is pointing towards. Now, shortly into this investigation, uh, we had already s- discussed one lead that went that went nowhere. You know, mm-hmm. they're able to clear concrete Bob. Um, but the sheriff's department is going to catch a break. Uh, this is when a white van 
was spotted. Uh, this white van was from Washington, had Washington plates on it, uh, and was reported to the sheriff's department. Now, the vehicle was spotted about 70 miles north of Coeur d'Alene. This would be near the Montana and Can- Canada borders at a store that caters for hunters and outdoor enthusiasts. The vehicle was reported because uh, a man was at the store with two children that got out of the vehicle. They didn't buy anything. They didn't actually even shop at all. The man simply asked for directions. He asked for directions to a, a place called Libby, Montana. So the, the police are very interested in this because we have this man here and he's got two children that are of the same age as Shasta and Dylan in this vehicle heading out of the state. Well, they search and search and search for this vehicle and it doesn't turn up. They're, they're not able to locate the van that's with the Washington plates. Well, and it could be anybody. I mean, there's a lot of people traveling with two kids, but those kids are two kids of their own. Yeah, and the thing is here, Captain, we would have a lot of similar sightings to this uh, over the course of some time because, you know, the Sheriff's Department really was doing everything they could to try to find these these two children. There were There were billboards going up with both of their pictures very, you know, big, beautiful pictures of the two kids on there so that everybody could see their faces. You could get a sense of their height and their weight, know where they're missing from. And and there were people looking for these kids all over the area. So, of course, we're going to have some different, quote unquote, sightings from time to time. Right. And the sheriff's department has already looked into a close friend, the concrete Bob. But also, we just assume that they'd have to look into family members, especially because there are three murders and two abductions. Mm hmm. And the, the children's father, uh, this is Stephen Groney. Of course, he came under suspicion. Um, and, and I say, of course, just because, you know, we know that that's a typical, normal part of any investigative process when you're investigating the murder and deaths of family members. You, well, you're going to be questioned. You, you gotta, probably should be questioned. Right? Yeah, you got to look at the ex-husband or if there's an ex-wife or somebody, anybody inside that inner circle. Um, but the, but furthermore, he became under suspicion a little bit more than normal because of, of some of the statements that he had made, uh, to the public and to the media. Mm-hmm. Now on several occasions, the father, Stephen Groney, now he, he was pleading to the killers of the family and to the abductors of the ch- two children on these, you know, p- press conferences and interviews any chance that he got, he was he was speaking directly to the abductors. And the one thing that the sheriff's department, they found strange, was that Stephen Groney kept saying, he said this multiple times, that, that the abductor should drop the children off at a location of his choosing and anonymously phone in where he had dropped them off. And that, that they should, please do not kill these kids because Mm -hmm. they had nothing to do with this. And he would often say that the kids had nothing to do with this. And that's the statement that, that caused the sheriff's department to, to have some uneasy feelings about Stephen groaning because their, their whole thing was they could not, they could not establish or determine a motive for the crime that took place. Right. And now we have somebody on the inner circle saying that the children have nothing to do with this. Right. Almost like assuming he knows what the motive was. Mm -hmm. And also I think it's very suspicious on the idea of, Hey, just uh, pick a place, drop them off and call an anonymous. It's almost like he's setting up a scenario for him to be able to drop off the kids somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You're right. Or, or that someone that he knows of could just drop them somewhere and not, not be seen, not be caught, especially mm-hmm. if the kids aren't going to reveal who dropped them off or who's been holding them. Um, yeah. Then the issue becomes what's his alibi for Sunday and Monday. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too, is I think he's pretty upfront and in the public eye quite a bit during this, this investigation. It's not like he's, he's hiding behind closed doors and he's phoning these things in. He's, He's at the forefront of this. Well, and the other thing, too, is, yeah, maybe you see a motive or or anger or revenge or something against the ex-wife with the new boyfriend, but him killing his own teenage boy? Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't. 
I don't know. It doesn't seem it doesn't seem extremely likely. Right. Uh, the other thing here, though, Captain, is you know during questioning and things like that with the father of the children of Stephen Groney. Now, the the other thing they were concerned about was that they stated that he had failed parts of his polygraph test. Not mm-hmm. they they weren't saying he failed the polygraph test. They were saying it appears he was deceptive at portions of this test. But of course, they would not go on. To, to inform us as to what these portions of the test were that, that they believed him Wait, to be Right, but that could be nerves or anything. I, I'd, I'd really be interested in taking one myself just to see what kind of scenario that is and, and, and the effects of that. Mm-hmm. Well, and the thing too here is, Captain, you know, a lot of that's based off of, you know, your your what's going on with you e- internally at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So you you have this horrible situation where, your ex-wife has been killed right. and your son has been killed. And now you have a daughter and son who are missing. Well, you have a lot, you got a lot of emotions in you yeah, at this probably point. Probably a lot of anxiety running through you and anger, and look, sadness, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, look, I mean, I think the important thing is, you know, especially somebody that had kids with this, with the lady that was murdered, you know, it's not just his ex-wife, it's the mother of his children. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, that, and now you have two missing children yourself. And I think that's why, you know, this is this is one reason why these tests aren't something that they use in the court of law, because right. there there is errors. And on top of that, a lot of the, let's say, determining whether somebody's deceptive or not is coming from an expert's opinion, right. where you might be able to show this to another quote unquote expert. And they say, I'm not seeing any signs of deception here. Yeah, but I think it's a good barometer. Mm-hmm. You know, I still think it's something that they could use during the investigation to give the the police some kind of lead. Yes, I think it. I think it can be helpful when conducted by experienced uh, investigators. When you have people that that have conducted these tests time and time again and have experience as far as many years investigating these crimes, because I'm a big believer in that old gut feeling, and I think that that comes with experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the thing here is captain, the, the national center for missing and exploited children got involved. We talked about the billboards that were set up. Um, and, and you know, this is one of our favorite organizations. Uh, they yeah, sent out my only, my only issue is we donated money and now we get like an email every day <laughs> asking for more money. <laughs> well, we've donated a few times, but, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. They they remind us that, uh, that Hey, we're be, still here. Hey, we're still, <laughs> yeah, we know we talk about you every other week on the show. Yeah. Um, anyway, they, uh, they sent out notifications nationwide regarding the two missing children, uh, and they distributed over 100,000 flyers. Um, throughout the Western American states. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, this this was interesting the way that they did this. They were contacting businesses, and so if you had a gas station or a restaurant or something like that, they would they would send out a fax or an email mm-hmm. to these different businesses, and they would also send out flyers wherever they could. So they're trying to get the the pictures of these children in front of people that might, you know, if someone stops for gas, if someone goes into a store to to shop or to, to buy food, you know, whoever took these kids, you would assume is somewhat on the run if the kids are still alive. And the sheriff's department is Mm -hmm. working with the expectation that the kids may still be on, still be alive. Yeah. I think it's, I, I think it'd be silly to just assume they're on the run. I mean, we've seen a lot of times where somebody is abducted and then they're taken back to the person's lair or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that that's a big possibility they need to be looking into as well. So if somebody refers to their home as their lair, we should just assume they're guilty of horrible yeah. things. <laughs> well, just well, don't don't go over there for a barbecue. Is what I'm saying. Uh, the the crime and the missing children were also featured on America's Most Wanted. Uh, they featured the story twice, mm-hmm. and I believe that they ran it on two Saturdays in a row. Um, these would be the two Saturdays following the when the crime actually took place. So nationally, everybody is looking for these kids. And meanwhile, the investigators are still analyzing evidence that they've collected from the crime scene. But on a, on a sad note, they're also, they're searching the local landfills 
because they're wondering if maybe the kids were dumped somewhere. Right. Um, you know, these, these are all things that are necessary to do, but one terrible thing that was really working against those fighting for a good outcome. Well, there was a, a bit of a delay in getting the Amber alert out for these two children. So once that Amber alert goes out, uh, it would hit the emergency broadcast system uh, the state lottery commission, all the news and media outlets, as well as the notification boards along the highways in Idaho, parts of Montana, Washington, and Oregon. Mm-hmm. Now, part of the delay was because at first they didn't even know that the kids were missing. You know, they didn't know that they had kids involved in this crime until notifying the family about the three murders. Seems like something that you should be able to figure out within, you know, a half an hour. Well, then there was further delay because of a bunch of bureaucratic bullshit, basically. Right. So, so the the family is killed, and the two ch- the kids were taken either on late on May the fifteenth or early in the morning on May the sixteenth, according to the body temperatures. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so the bodies are not discovered until late on the sixteenth. They became aware of the missing children early on the seventeenth. And the Amber Alert does not go out until the morning of the 18th. So yeah, that's just that's ridiculous. Yeah. So by the time the Amber Alert goes out, we have about 48 to 60 hours that have passed based on depending how you you shake it or, or depending on the actual time of. Yeah. Death. There, there's a nine and an eight year old that their lives are depending on this stuff. You d- don't mess it up. Yeah. And the the really aggravating thing here is I, I mentioned bureaucratic bullshit well a lot of that was jesus dropping the s bombs all over the place a lot of that was that at the time there there were people involved that said that they didn't know that this particular crime or these two missing kids actually fit the criteria what for an amber alert yeah it should be this simple there's children missing issue an amber alert that's it thank you you know that's it eight and nine year old yes and the thing here that we got to keep in mind too, that we have we have additional problems in this crime, right? Because we we all know how this we know how unlikely a good outcome is in a child slash stranger abduction, especially after forty eight hours has expired. Well, and look, we've covered how many cases now? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, did, I realized I didn't give a number uh, there when you uh, asked me. Well, yeah, I don't know either. Because think about all the cases that we haven't uh, released because we never recorded them because we're just sitting around in the garage. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> Drunk. Um, we should have recorded all that stuff because then then when we needed a week off. But the thing here now, to me, looking at this case as it's developing, okay, at first you start thinking, yeah, maybe this revenge-type killing, you know, maybe it's the ex-husband uh, maybe it's a friend that they, you know, lent money to. Mm-hmm. Uh, where's the motive? But right. now that you have an eight and nine year old missing, to me, the motive becomes more sinister. It mm-hmm. becomes um, the motive starts leaning itself towards this idea that I had to kill the, I had to kill the the parents and the teenager because my victim of choice is under, let's say, ten or so. And so now to me, it's now I I think you're going to your fear is that these kids are going to die. But my initial fear is what kind of torture are they going to have to go through before that death occurs? Right. And to me, then this motive becomes uh, sexual. Yeah. And, And you're right. You're exactly right. We have a crime where they can't figure out the motive, but. The other thing that the investigators are saying at the time is that this they're not releasing what they believe the motive to be. However, they're stating that, you know, this is a crime for which there's no profile for this type of crime. There's nothing that they were taught coming up that that would teach them about this exact type of crime. Mm-hmm. And I think you can kind of figure out exactly what motive they believe they're working with, because what did they state very early on into the investigation The sheriff's department said that the only thing that appeared to have been stolen from the crime scene was the kids. Right. 
So not only are we playing behind the eight ball because, because of the delay in the Amber Alert, but also think about this. You know, we don't have a suspect name. We do not have a suspect vehicle description or a direction of travel for this vehicle. And plus, keep in mind, in Idaho, you can be in, in another state in minutes Almost heck, you could you could jump the Canadian well, with, border well, rather every, quickly right, from there. Right. But with every state, depending on where you're at in the state, you can be out of the state within minutes. No, I get that, but they they were in northern Idaho, and if you picture the the outline of Idaho, that right, puts you right. in several states very quickly. Um, you know, and we stated that 48 hours is kind of the 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 mark there that you got to be concerned about because 74 mm-hmm. percent of kidnapped children that were that are killed. They are killed within three hours of the Jesus. abduction. Jesus. Yeah. And that's why we donate our money. Of course. And the thing here is, you know, f- for everybody out there listening that has pitched into the beer fund, cheers. You know, cheers to you because you are the reason that we donated money to the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children on several occasions. Because, you know, once the fridge is full, we'll just be greedy at that point. If we're, if we're not passing that along and trying to do well, some good with it. And it's one hell of an organization. It's, it really is. It's, it's been, uh, the, the recovery rate has increased, uh, for finding these kids and returning them home safely has increased since the organization and foundation has been created. So it really truly is a good thing. Yeah. And we're not trying to pat ourselves on the back. We are kind of greedy bastards because we do fill up two fridges, before we <laughs> but we're also trying to pat Pat everybody else on the back at the same time. All right. My so, hand is getting tired. All right. So we have Concrete Bob. and right. And he's ruled out. Correct. And we have the ex-husband. Yes. Um, and and I think I think with the ex-husband here, Captain. Jabroni. I, I think. Um, no, Stephen Groney. Yeah, Stephen Jabroni. Uh, I think that we have a situation here where there might be some speculation and some suspicion a little bit, but I don't think that it's like something that they're really putting a ton of weight into. Mm -hmm. The guy has obviously been horribly affected by the crime. uh, And he's, like I said, he's on the front line of this investigation. He's out there with his time. He's pleading to the abductor. He's speaking to the killers and asking Mm -hmm. for the children back. Right. But so, so he's, Kind of on the sideline. We're mm-hmm. we're going to keep looking at him, but what's next in the investigation? Okay, so let's let's fast forward a little bit here, right? Mm-hmm. Because those are all jump into the DeLorean. Those are all things that were taking place within the first week or two of the investigation. And before we moved on from that, I wanted to bring up the problem with the Amber Alert because it is a good system when you when you put it into act, into action immediately, right? That's right. the whole point of it. Mm-hmm. So anyway. Three weeks into the investigation. Now, hope is actually, it's, it's starting to fade by this point. The sheriff's department, they, they don't know who the killer or killers are, nor do they know wh- the whereabouts of Shasta and Dylan. By this time, they had interviewed 700 people. They had received and chased 1,700 tips and leads. And they had nothing new to announce to the media and the community at this point. Three weeks into the investigation, no new information to present anybody. And of course, they they have to have some information that they hold back, right? We know that. Well, one one investigator did offer up his opinion, though, regarding the crimes, stating that the murders had to have been premeditated because whoever perpetrated the murders brought the necessary materials with them to bind the victims as well as bringing the murder instrument as well stating it was an extremely violent scene and in his experience a violent crime scene usually means the motivation is one of three things for him it's either money drugs or love stating that this is the type of crime scene that he would expect to see involvement from like a Columbia drug Lord or something like that. But he also pointed out, you know, that Brenda Groney and Mark McKenzie, they were not dealing with large sums of money 
at any point. Right. They were also not dealing with large sums of drugs, and they themselves didn't show any signs of having drug issues. They found drugs in their system, but they couldn't find any reason to point out that the that the adults had drug problems. Well, that is ridiculous because here, look. I I, I don't get, think so. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I I understand that people use drugs recreation recreationally. Correct. I understand that people drink some beers, maybe smoke a little pot. Once you start doing something like meth, it's a it's a whole different ball game. So, so the idea that they don't have drug issues, that's to me. That's just that's me. That's my opinion. I get what you're saying. I I do get what you're saying because to me, you're right. You would think that they're. If you had to put out all the drugs on the line and, and make and make a line, draw a line in the sand that says, okay, these are for recreational use and everything on this side would suggest that you have some kind of drug issue or problem. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. I would probably, I would put methamphetamine in the side of you got a drug problem. Right. Um, I, you know, but, but this is the sheriff's department stating this. And I think that some doesn't mean they're correct. It doesn't mean that they're correct, but the reason why I agree with their side on this one is that for the simple fact that they, the 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 parents both held down jobs. Okay, they were they were listed. They were said to be hardworking, family oriented people. But everybody also said the people that knew them closely. They said they were hardworking people, family oriented people, but they liked to party a little bit. Right. And they like to cut loose a little bit, but like I said, according cut to the, loose on a Sunday night before work on Monday, uh, okay. uh, uh, I do when there's uh, no, I do when there's NFL football on, but uh, yeah, that's called drinking some beers. Uh, you know, that's not called uh, methamphetamine, right? But the thing here is, like, like I said, they they did not find any uh, proof that there was manufacturing going on in the house that they were storing drugs, selling drugs. And furthermore, like I stated, they didn't state that they even found any drugs at all. It actually looks like they did not find any drugs in the possession of the home. Because they took them all. And on top of that, here, here's, here's where I really side with them. Okay. Is that they loaned a friend $2,000. And what I mean by that is I think that people that have drug problems probably have money problems. And they're not really in a position to be loaning out money to to friends and family <laughs> this okay sure so i mean you look at every rock star that has a bunch of money they uh, they didn't have this family did not have a bunch right, of right but what i'm stating is your 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 thought process is well because they had two thousand dollars to loan out that they didn't have a drug problem that is what i just said said yes right and what i'm saying that would be like saying well like ray charles he didn't have a heroin problem because he didn't have a money problem no, he had a heroin problem. I, that's all I'm saying. I think I see what you're saying, but I, we, th- I think we should agree that Ray Charles was in a much different situation than Brenda Groney and Mark McKenzie. Right, I understand that, but what I, what I'm stating is, to me, uh, the type of drug they're using to me is a, a sign of that. That's something. That's a serious recreational drug. Mm-hmm. So. So the the sheriff's department stating that this one member stating that he would have expected this to be the result of of money, drugs, or love, and he also stated that you know they they looked into that drug angle and they didn't believe that was the cause of this crime. Right. They also looked into the love angle as well, and this turned up nothing. And they, you know, the money and the drug issues all kind of the same thing there. So. They're going nowhere with this. This is like they had said. There, this is a crime for which there was no profile for. Now, in 2005, Father's Day fell on Sunday, June 19th. And on Father's Day, Stephen Groney told reporters it was his Father's Day wish that his two children, Shasta and Dylan, would safely return home. But of course, he had prepared himself for the worse. He also told them that he was losing hope as well, stating that he was very optimistic the first couple of weeks that they were missing, and he thought that the kids would be home soon. Mm -hmm. But as the weeks drug on, he was no longer optimistic. Yeah, and I couldn't imagine uh, what a parent or family member would be going through at that moment, you know, as the days drag on. 
they'd probably have to fill like the longest days in the world. Well, a couple of weeks after Father's Day, this would bring us to July 2nd, 2005 now. Um, at 1.40 a.m., we have two guys that are outside of a 24-hour Denny's restaurant. They're outside smoking cigarettes. When they see, I love me some Denny's, though. When they see a red Jeep Cherokee, uh, this has Missouri license plates on it. Okay. The vehicle pulls into the parking lot and out jumps a middle-aged man and a little girl. The guys smoking quickly recognize the little girl to be Shasta the one that they had seen on billboards and missing flyers uh, all over all over the area. Right. Uh, one of the guys, he texts his girlfriend. Uh, the girlfriend is sitting inside. She's, you know, inside eating as he's outside smoking a cigarette. He texts her to fill her in on what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this guy and I'm seeing this girl that's, she looks exactly like Shasta. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call the police. The, the, the guys decide that the two of them are not going to let this guy and girl leave the restaurant. They're not going to tip them off right. that, that they've spotted them, but they're not going to let them leave the restaurant until the police have a chance to speak with the both of them. I, I guarantee you these, these two gentlemen that were smoking, they got the fight jitters. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean, like they're probably all like riled up at this point. Like, mm-hmm. okay, we just got to keep an eye on him without tipping our hand but we can't let this individual get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And at the same time though, they're a little concerned that they might be uh, mistaken because they don't Mm -hmm. see a little boy in this situation. It's just the little girl in the, in the strange man. So they're going to contact the police, but kind of interesting twist here though, is that uh, the manager of the Denny's contacts the police as well. Yeah, so the way that this story works is this. The man and the girl, they go into the restaurant. And now the restaurant has some missing persons posters. They're, they're you know, posted in the, in the vestibule or near the entrance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, shortly after the man walks in, the, the girl of the poster, the poster of the girl, I'm sorry, right. is, is removed. It, it suddenly disappears uh, from the wall. Why? From Maybe from the guy. Okay. Yeah, he take he takes down the poster. Okay. So they are seated, and the man orders drinks uh, and meals for both him and the girl. The waitress then recognizes the girl to be Shasta as well. She notifies her manager about the situation. By now, we're at about one forty one a.m. Both the manager and, as the captain had stated, one of the guys outside smoking, had called nine one one. Shortly after the call, a police officer responding to the call pulls into the parking lot. Now, they suspect that this man must have seen the cop because he quickly asked the waitress for his bill. He then got up and he took the girl with him and he headed toward the restrooms. Now, two more police cars pulled into the parking lot during this time. Of course, all three cars were, they were quiet. You know, none of them had their lights on or their sirens on as they did not want to alert the man that, that uh, you know, that he and the girl had been sighted and right. been reported to authorities. But he knows. Well, when the man and the girl return to their booth where they were seated, the man leaned over across the table to the little girl. He whispers something to her. Um, no one really knows what, what is said. No one heard what the man said to her. Now, by this time, the officers are inside the restaurant and they approached the man and they told him they would like to speak with him outside. Now the, the man, he, he goes with them without incident. Once outside, he spoke with the officers briefly, and then they put him in the back of one of their cars. Now, the little girl at this point, once she's alone, she looks at the waitress and she tells her that her name is Shasta Groney and that oh, she w- she wants to see her daddy. Even though the little girl appeared to be fine, mm-hmm. um, she, she didn't appear to have any you know noticeable injuries on her. She appeared to be healthy. Um, she was quickly taken to the an area hospital as this is standard procedure. Um, and she remained in the hospital for a couple of days. Now Shasta's father, Stephen Groney, 
uh, he was notified and uh, he w- he had actually gone to Seattle uh, on a short trip to visit his sister. Uh, shortly after arriving in Seattle, he gets a phone call that they found his daughter. Right. And so he's going to have to travel back from Seattle to, to, to Coeur d'Alene. Now, th- now keep in mind, here's the strange thing here, Captain. This Denny's restaurant is, is located near, relatively near where the crime scene took place, where this girl was abducted from. Okay. So the man who is apprehended, uh, he sat in jail, and all the while everyone is wondering what happened to Dylan. Yeah, that's the question here. I mean, one, we need to figure out if they were, you know, were they witnesses to the murders? Mm-hmm. Where there's more than one um, perpetrator? Perpetrator. Uh, is there maybe a group of people working? What is the motive? Uh, what trauma has she gone through? Where was she kept or where was she held during this time right, that like she I, was abducted? Like I said, I you know, again, people assuming that they're on the run, uh, I don't think is, you know, you should never assume. But also, where is Dylan and who is this man that they have in custody? And that's what we'll get into next episode. Yes, we're going to have a lot of answers for you. More on this case, more on this story tomorrow. Thanks to everybody for joining us in the garage for another beer. And until tomorrow, if you need any True Crime Garage, go to truecrimegarage.com. And thank you, Nick. Thank you, Captain. Th- thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Everybody, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Thank you.